So uh, we're going to go on with inspiring you. And we haven't had a lot of art yet. And I think uh, we're going to get some now. Uh, from Barbara Putman Kramer. Oh, there she is. <laughs> No, <laughs> the relationship is there. Now, anyway, she's an industrial designer who just finished her, her degree, but she's um, um, a very interesting lady, I think. Uh, it, as an industrial ecologist, she makes unexpected connections. That was what was being said by uh, Second Sight. That is a trend platform, and she won the upcoming. She is the upcoming talent trend watcher of the year 2012. You know, trend watchers, all these people that know all these things before you and I do. And then, you know, that's very, I think that's great. And what they, what they do then, they put it on Twitter, they, they blog about it, and they put it on Facebook, and they put it on Pinterest. I don't know if you want, you know what Pinterest is. You pin something there. So have a look for her uh, in, on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest. And um, she's going to, uh, yeah, talk about the relationship between food which we've been doing this morning too, sustainability and design. So, Barbara, floor is yours. There is one video in between and then the... Whereas the post consumption phase deals with waste. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so that is also um, a moment that I feel at this is because why do, don't we address that phase in the middle the phase of consumption because it's so complex um, because we never think of the daily routines um, when we, you know when we use all the products and services that we buy so that's actually a gray box that we that we kind of choose not to look into and that's an example of when i start to feel at this ease because a large part uh, of unsustainabilities are hidden in these daily routines, are hidden in our standards of normality, in our daily behavior. And um, a characteristic of standards is that we don't question them. Um, think of, um, think of um, how next to normal it is to shower for more than 10 minutes or to not eat these veggies that never ever enter the supermarket. Um, or to heat your house to tropical temperatures in, in the middle of winter. So, as a curious student, I turned my hopes to science and I decided to study industrial ecology. A dominant mantra that I experienced there in that kind of world of sustainability um, is that of uh, the three R's of reduce, reuse 
and recycle. Um, but for me, that was, a, that was a lot about optimizing material flows or reducing carbon emissions um, and overcoming metal scarcity. And for a relentless optimist like me, that's not very motivating or exciting or engaging. So uh, for my thesis uh, within industrial ecology, um, I decided to question this reductionist approach to sustainability. And I looked into and I actually found certain groups of people who have already made steps to create a standard of normality that, is more, that, that contributes more to a sustainable future. In my case, I studied flexitarians, people who um, purposely uh, minimize their meat consumption, urban farmers, uh, people who grow their own food, and locavores, people who, uh, who prefer to eat um, food that's grown in their local vicinity. And when I did that, when I studied these people, I actually saw glimpses of the future. And why do I say glimpses of the future? Because this is the behavior that could grow into new standards of normality. And that's why I actually believe that um, scrutinizing the mainstream system for incremental efficiencies is not the way I would like to approach sustainability. Instead, I would like to, um, instead, when I look at the system with different eyes, I see that a lot of promising behavior is already un unfolding right in front of us. And it actually brings immaterial and material value to both the environment and the people involved. And when I say, uh, and when you want to foster promising behavior, um, that actually requires a systemic effort. And in the real world, this is called design. But it is design of a, of a, of a very specific nature. It's not the design of my shoes or the design of the TED logo. It's design of a more complex nature. It's actually the redesign of behavior. And that's because, in my opinion, there are no sustainable products, but only sustainable behaviors. So you are both designer and subject to design. You are designer and designee in one. Now, you still might be curious about the element that I referred to in the beginning that I feel is often overlooked. Well, the other day, I received an email from my friend Adrian, And what she said in her email was, what they do is so incredibly innovative, inspiring, and colorful. It's so beautiful that it made my eyes hurt. That sounds like an object of design to me. But I'll tell you that this woman, this, uh, is called, uh, this woman, Adrian, is actually 50 years old and, as we speak, interning at her favorite restaurant in Paris. And for her, the food is so beautiful there that it hurts her eyes. And for me, to witness so much attention and devotion to something as elementary as food supports my view to see food as a means to change. Um, and um, I actually developed this whole view of seeing food as a means to change um, a couple of years ago when I crossed the Indian Ocean and I went to study sustainable development in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, at that point, it was in 2009, uh, Melbourne was recovering from its most extreme droughts and bushfires in history. So for me, it was the first time that I physically experienced our reliance on natural resources more than I had ever experienced in the Netherlands. Also, I was, I was surrounded by environmental engineers. Um, so very quickly, I learned how to shower within two minutes. Um, I ate a lot more vegetarian, and I took an, a veggie box membership from the local food co-op at my university. But most of all, I was really inspired by the Melbourne food culture, which is very diverse and very sustainable. Um, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> And I was mostly amazed by the fact that it never felt moralistic, you know, the way they handled food. Because in Melbourne, people han han handled their food not as fuel, but rather as a feast. So it was never politically induced or moralistic. But instead, it was natural and self-evident. So when I returned to the Netherlands, I really wondered why we treat food so differently here. Why we see it as fuel rather than a feast. 
where we only see what is on our plate rather than where it comes from or what it does to our bodies or to our senses. And it's very easy to see food as fuel. I agree. Fast food, eating behind your laptop, eating on the road, we all do it. I do it too sometimes. But also during the past years, I have expanded my perception and relationship to food, but mostly my perception on food, because food is so much more than fuel. So of course, food fills, food fills your stomach and it has a good taste, but it also has a color, it has texture, it has a smell. Food has, um, has an origin, it has a maker, a producer or a farmer. Food is distributed and sold by someone or packaged. And food has an age. We have reduced the age of food to an expiry date. Food is also a carrier of culture, of our norms and values, and of, uh, and of rituals, whether annual or daily, birthdays, weddings, Christmas. So food is a lot more than fuel. And realize that we in the Netherlands actually eat, on average, a thousand meals a year. That means that you have a thousand opportunities to make small shifts in the food system per person per year. I love the way Annie Dillard puts it because she says, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Your handling of food is actually your way of life or, or is a representation of your way of life. It's your signature. And I bet that you can change your signature if I give you a thousand chances. Well, now on how you can make a difference. Back to Adrian, because her email wasn't finished. Um, Adrian actually um, finished her email by saying, and sometimes when I'm in the kitchen, I don't even understand what the chefs are doing, although I'm literally on top of it. Adrian is a food professional, and even for her, it's sometimes very difficult or maybe impossible to understand the game we play with our food. And, and, and as with every game, if you want to succeed, you need to pay attention and be devoted. And that's your choice. That is your choice. So what I saw in Melbourne was people contributing to a sustainable food future by treating food as a feast rather than a fuel. They didn't see it as a moral obligation, but instead they were naturally inclined to create something beautiful. And that's also what Kant says here. If we do what morals say is right because of, positive and natural, because of a positive and natural inclination, then we perform a beautiful act. So the mindset of the people in Melbourne and actually the fact that they felt that they were designers of their own environment made the difference. So that's again where design comes in. Design communicates with our senses, not just with our mind. A reductionist approach to sustainability only speaks to our sense of guilt, our sense of responsibility. It is not creative and therefore less likely to create something intrinsically beautiful. So observe, wonder, ask, question the unquestioned. How, when, where, why and with whom you eat or do not eat. That's all it takes to be a redesigner of your life and your environment. What I do and what you could do is, for instance, cook with different colors, try to eat something raw for a change, go hunting for herbs along the highway. That's what I did last Saturday. <laughs> or eat something you have never eaten before. Because redesign is rediscovery. And rediscovery is disclosing hidden potential. So I invite you to stop reducing and start adding and start looking for where you can foster or grow what you believe contributes to a sustainable food future. So 
make feeling at this ease part of your standard of normality a thousand times a year. Thank you.